Our next speaker is Dr. Ben Kravitz will continue to give us an idea of the kinds of technologies that can be used to image the metabolism in the tumor. Uh, Dr. Kravitz is a professor in the Skaggs Institute for Chemical Biology, and he's also the chair of the Department of Chemical Physiology at the Scripps Research Institute. His research group has been focused on the role that enzymes play in uh, pathology and other physiological processes, in particular in tumors. His, uh, he has uh, a degree uh, from the Scripps Institute in Macromolecular and Cellular Structure and Chemistry, and he remained at the Scripps uh, to become a professor there, uh, and he has since become uh, both the founder and the scientific advisor of Activix Biosciences. Which allows you to hopefully uh, detect, identify, and quantify your enzyme um, targets. Uh, I won't go through much of the, too much of the chemistry today, but through our lab's efforts and the efforts of many other groups, there are now legitimate activity-based profiling tools for well over a dozen, if not two dozen, enzyme families, including a variety of, of, of metabolic enzymes and, and, and kinases and such. And we'll focus today on, on hydrolytic enzymes and their role in or, or using the technology to, to study hydrolytic enzymes in cancer. Um, the certain hydrolases are actually, I would argue, the largest metabolic enzyme family in humans. There's well over 120, there's over 200 some odd enzymes from this class in total, it's about 1% of your proteome, a subset of which are proteases, and another 120 of which are actually metabolic enzymes, ranging from peptidases to lipases, small molecule hydrolases, so on and so forth. Um, and as you can see from this diagram, uh, where I've color-coded them, characterized and uncharacterized, they clearly fall within that, 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 that structure that I described previously, where half the enzymes lack any annotation whatsoever. Um, what they do all share in common, though, is an apparently reactive serine nucleophile that performs hydrolytic chemistry, which means that you can create complementary electrophilic probes that selectively react with that nucleophilic group, such as the fluorophosphonate zone shown here. So if one creates reporter tag versions of fluorophosphonates, these become activity-based profiling tools for the serine hydrolase class. Um, and as you'll see later on, we can use uh, fluorescent probes for rapid, say, gel-based detection of probe labeling events in cancer cells, and then biotin probes to affinity enrich and identify um, your targets. So there's two major applications, I think, that we and others use activity profiling for. One is to discover enzymes that are dysregulated in interesting pathophysiological settings. The other is to discover inhibitors for those very same enzymes to start annotating their function. And I'll give you a couple stories that touch on both those um, applications. Before I do so, though, let me just give you a little flavor of what the technology looks like so you can follow the images I'll show. So um, this is what a typical gel-based readout might look like of an activity profiling experiment where you add the probe to a certain number of cancer cells, let it react for a certain amount of time, the probe is fluorescent, you just run the samples out in a gel, slap it on a flatbed scanner, visualize your enzyme targets. So you might go horizontally across this gel to look for differentially expressed enzyme activities in these, in these cancer cells. This is just here to remind me to remind you that I'll show you some more activity gels later on in grayscale because it typically enhances contrast and they're not western blots or silver staining. They're still fluorescent probe labeling events and I'll, I'll try to remind you about that. Of course, that, that, that image in of itself doesn't tell you the identities of the enzyme targets. Um, you can uh, uh, achieve that information by swapping out the fluorescent probe uh, and, br and bringing into bear a, a biotinylated probe, which allows you to affinity and richer targets. You at this stage can just skip the gel step altogether and do a shotgun LCMS uh, uh, approach, an analogous to the, uh, the multidimensional protein identification or mud pit technologies pioneered by John Yates' lab at Scripps. These are really uh, powerful methods because it allows us now in a single day to profile hundreds of enzymes in parallel in complex sa samples such as tumors or cells. Um, and maybe uh, from, from, from one of our major lab's goals and one of the, the themes of this talk, what's quite exciting is a lot of these enzymes really are totally uncharacterized, right? They just have such information-rich names as chromosome 19, open reading frame 27, right? They're um, predicted protein products from the human genome sequencing effort, and we can say for the first time they're enzymes from this class at this relative activity level uh, in a sample. Okay, so returning to our um, applications. So on the, um, uh, uh, oh, so no, so briefly before we do that, on the inhibitor discovery side, one slide real quickly for how this works. Pretty simple idea, right? If you can profile enzymes um, in, in proteomes, you could also pretreat that proteome with a small molecule inhibitor library, right? And if one or more of these inhibitors binds your enzyme of interest, it will block or slow probe labeling. And you can read that out in a variety of formats on a gel by a loss in fluorescence intensity of probe labeling. This is actually a pretty versatile assay, as we've learned over the years, because it doesn't require you to recombinantly express or purify your enzyme targets. In fact, almost all the medicinal chemistry that we perform in our lab uses native cancer cells or native tissues as a source of the enzymes. Um, also, because the probe serves as a universal assay tool, you don't need to have a de novo understanding of what the substrates are of the enzymes. If an uncharacterized enzyme is dysregulated in a cancer cell and you've got a probe that reacts with it, you've got your assay in hand and you're off looking for inhibitors. 
Um, and finally, because the probe profiles many enzymes from the class in parallel in a sample, you get a very good understanding of the selectivity of your inhibitor. If it blocks a dozen enzymes from that class in your sample, you'll know that, and you, you'll know you have more work to do to create a selective pharmacological tool. So this is the technology we use in our lab routinely to develop inhibitors for enzymes like hydrolases. Okay, so what are we gonna, what, what examples am I going to show you today? Um, so this is going to be an example of trying to understand enzyme activities that are dysregulated as cancer cells proceed from being, say, benign, less aggressive state to a more aggressive, malignant, and, and metastatic state. Um, with the idea being, if we could compare cancer cells across different tumor classes that display these different phenotypes, maybe we could identify enzymatic pathways that contributed to the aggressiveness or malignancy um, of cancer cells. And so uh, Nadine Jasani, Sherry Neeson, students in our lab performed this experiment across a, a large number of cells and a large number of conditions. I'm just showing you a snapshot of this study. Again, this is an activity gel just shown in grayscale. And what we're doing here is comparing non-aggressive and aggressive cancer cells from different tumors of origin, asking the, sim the simplistic question, do cancer cells from different tumor classes uh, as they become aggressive, consistently upregulate enzyme activity, say, from the hydrolase class. And, and you certainly see that is the case for a couple enzymes, that, and we'll discuss both of them in series, um, where uh, pretty much across a variety of epithelial-like cancers, as cancer cells become aggressive, they elevate these activities. The first one we'll discuss is this monoacylglycerol lipase enzyme, or MAGL, which migrates as a doublet in cancer cells because it's alternatively spliced for reasons that we don't, don't understand. Um, MAGL is not a totally uncharacterized enzyme. In fact, it, it, our lab and others have studied it for many years in a totally different context. It's role in regulating endocannabinoid signaling um, in the nervous system, where it regulates the, uh, the hydrolysis of this true arachidonoglycerol endocannabinoid lipid. But most of these cancer cells don't express appreciable levels of cannabinoid receptors, so we thought this might be an instance where they were repurposing uh, the, the MAGL enzyme for a distinct function. Um, and so we wanted to develop inhibitors for this enzyme, at which point there were none available to us uh, at this stage in the project. But John Long in our lab took on this task and through uh, a lot of medicinal chemistry I won't subject you to, developed this very selective and potent uh, in vivo active inhibitor of MAGL, JZL184. Um, all the data to support that claim is on this slide where you can see the uh, concentration-dependent blockade of both forms of maglipase in this aggressive cancer cell. None of the other hydrolases being labeled for our activity probe are affected in these cells. It's about a, a 10 nanomolar uh, inhibitor. So what does JZL184 do to cancer cells when you block uh, maglipase uh, activity? Um, so Dan Nomura, a postdoc in our lab who just started his faculty position at, at UC Berkeley a few days ago, uh, performed metabolomic analysis of, can of aggressive cancer cells treated with the maglipase uh, inhibitor. The first metabolic change you see, which is what you might expect to see from normal tissues, is an elevation in the monoacylglyceride substrates of the enzymes. You inhibit the enzyme and monoacylglycerides go up. Interestingly, they go up to the same level as you observe in a non-aggressive cancer cell that doesn't express maglipase. You can already sort of see a metabolic switch occurring between non-aggressive and aggressive cancer cells. Uh, when this enzyme is overexpressed, you, you deplete monoacylglyceride um, levels. And this is rectified by an inhibitor of the enzyme. The next metabolic signature that we observed, however, was, was somewhat surprising to us because it's not what you observe in normal cells and tissues, and that is um, that the free fatty acid products of, of, the, of the maglipase hydrolytic reaction were also suppressed and, and reduced. In fact, reduced back down to basically the levels you observe in a non-aggressive cancer cell um, that, does not, that does not express maglipase. So this suggests to us that maglipase was also controlling free fatty acid levels um, in cancer cells. And as I alluded to, this is not a footprint of what, what you see with a maglipase inhibitor in, in, in an in vivo system with normal tissues, where you see elevations in monoacylglycerides, but no change in free fatty acids. So I think David mentioned earlier the idea that his, his systems with serine metabolism were looking at sort of a shift in rate-limiting steps in cancer cells for metabolic pathways. And I think this is going to be a common theme that we're going to observe in cancer cell metabolism, which is that there's going to be a shift in sort of the balance of roles that enzymes play in metabolic pathways. And here, maglipase seems to take on the role of regulating fatty acids in cancer cells selectively. You can recapitulate that metabolic uh, footprint with a small hairpin RNA that targets maglipase. Um, so we were quite excited by this because as already been alluded to maybe momentarily in earlier talks, one of the uh, most common dysregulated metabolic pathways that you observe in cancer cells is lipogenesis, or the de novo production of fatty acids. And this has largely uh, been studied in the context of the enzyme fatty acid synthase. This is one of the earliest changes that uh, transformation induces metabolically in cancer cells, the, the capacity to de novo produce um, fatty acids. And if you look deeper into these reviews, um, what you see is, is that they draw some, some, I think, very accurate metabolic pathway diagrams and place fatty acid synthase at the stage where it makes, say, palmitate units for lipid, bio, lipid uh, biosynthesis and signaling lipids and other purposes. 
Um, but there also is somewhat of a conundrum that comes out of these diagrams because they also point out that the fatty acids that emerge from fatty acid synthase are rapidly incorporated into neutral and phospholipid stores. And so I think if cancer cells need to use these fatty acid units for whatever purpose, energy, uh, biosynthetic precursors for membrane lipids or signaling uh, uh, molecules, they're going to need to have a complementary lipolytic pathway to free up uh, these fatty acids uh, for those functions. And then we believe that's where maglipase um, plays a role. So fatty acid synthase uh, disruption actually affects the pathogenesis of cancer cells. So we then asked, would the same uh, a or similar phenotype be observed with blocking uh, maglipase? And indeed, if you disrupt maglipase's expression or activity, you see substantial reductions in cancer cell migration, survival, and invasion. And those, and those, those in vitro phenotypes result in um, a, a diminution of or a slowing of tumor growth uh, in vivo, either with the shRNA or with the small molecule um, inhibitor. So, so we would interpret these results to mean that maglipase is required uh, for at least some cancer cells to maintain a highly aggressive or pathogenic state. Um, and for, in data I won't show you today uh, for the sake of time, we believe that most of this, not, not all of it, but most of it is through uh, the, the ability of maglipase to produce protumorigenic fatty acid uh, lipids um, and, and not so much through the uh, regulation of, of endocannabinoids.